I think white people um, distrust the bishop more than black people do. Um, although he's not really seen as a man of violence, uh, he's not associated with the ANC or with sabotage, people think that what uh, he does will in the end result in turmoil. Uh, many white people do think that. Many white people do not think that what the bishop can achieve will be peace and stability for all. Do you think that what he is doing is furthering peace, or is it, is it not fighting for justice? Uh, it's fighting for justice, but that is part of the battle for peace. In fact, a major part in South Africa. I've been pleading, and he, of course, has been pleading for years for the world to understand, particularly the countries of the West, that there will be no peace in Southern Africa without justice. There cannot be. And therefore, what he is doing as a Christian voice is proclaiming this truth. The recent constitutional changes in South Africa have given some small say to Asians and coloureds in running their own affairs. But for blacks, there is nothing. And on the streets, perhaps because of that, the violence has flared again. The name of Sharpeville is once more in the news. At such a time, to honour one of the loudest opponents of apartheid, albeit a non-violent one, seems likely to anger the guardians of the system that these rioters are trying to demolish. The South African government will feel this is yet another slap in the face, uh, for them from the international community. And, th and that also is a positive thing. It couldn't happen to a, bench, a better bunch of people. <laughs> Tonight, Bishop Tutu will be flying back home, no doubt to a hero's welcome. But earlier, I spoke to him in New York about today's award. Bishop, in congratulating you on this award, let me ask you if you agree with those who have already described it as something of a slap in the face for the South African government. Thank you very much for your, for your congratulations. Um, the award has certainly uh, sent a very strong uh, political signal to the South African government uh, in pointing out that uh, the world cares about injustice and oppression and affirming those who are opposed to apartheid. Do you think it's a signal, however, that will have any effect on the government or on life in South Africa? Um, I believe that uh, this is not just a personal award, it is uh, a corporate award uh, involving so many people uh, at home and around the world who have supported us with their prayers. And it is saying to the South African government whether they pay attention to this or not, or appear not to pay, at pay attention, uh, you, you will not be accepted into the family of free nations until you dismantle apartheid. Even though your supporters have their morale boosted by yes. your winning the prize, <clears throat> do you think there's a, there's a danger that perhaps they might be encouraged into taking uh, stronger measures in support of black liberation in South Africa, including violent measures perhaps? Uh, we have to underline, haven't we, that uh, the primary violence in South Africa is the violence of the apartheid system, the violence of forced population removals, the violence of uh, excluding 70% of the population from a meaningful participation in um, uh, the political decision-making processes. And the remarkable thing is that our people have been so patient, I mean, peace-loving to a fault. And one would not be surprised that unless the international community um, intervenes on our behalf, that people then uh, decide to escalate um, the violence uh, in, in that situation in trying to correct it. So is, is it possible then, although you have won the Nobel Peace Prize, that yes. the, 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 the struggle with which you are identified against apartheid cannot be resolved in the end without greater violence? Uh, I believe that there is still the outside chance. I, I am the perennial optimist. I still believe that there is an outside chance that uh, if the international community exerts political, diplomatic, but above all economic pressure on the South African government uh, for us to resolve that crisis uh, by reasonably peaceful means. If that fails, of course, then the only alternative left is that which Mr. Foster called the, the alternative too ghastly to contemplate the bloodbath. Bishop Tutu, thank you very much indeed for joining us.
Thank you. What is black empowerment when it seems to benefit not the vast majority, but a small elite that tends to be recycled? Are we not building up much resentment that we may rule later? It will not do to say people did not complain when whites were enriched. When were the old regime our standards? The National Congress is increasingly disturbed by the manner in which the Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu is addressing the issue of the NPA and the pending case of the President of the ANC, Comrade Jacob Zuma. Uh, his tone and insistence on the pending outcome of the decision of the NPA suggests that he is either knowledgeable of the decision or seeking to preempt the outcome if that outcome is, is favouring uh, Comrade Jacob Zuma. Now, this is tantamount to him undermining the independence of the NPA and the judiciary, which is unfortunate for a person of his nature. Let the ANC no. That they have they have a large majority. Well, Mubarak had a large majority. Gaddafi had a large majority. Watch out. I am warning you. Watch out. Watch out. Please watch out. We were helped by the international community to overcome apartheid. We, people, were opposed to injustice and oppression, and people believed that we, South Africans, would automatically be on the side of those who were being oppressed. Tibet is being oppressed. Our government, representing me, representing me, says it will not support Tibetans who are being oppressed viciously by the Chinese. Hey, Mr. Mr. Zuma, you and your government don't represent me. You represent your own interests. And I'm warning you, I really am warning you, out of love. I am warning you like I warned the nationalists. I am warning you. One day, we will start praying for the defeat of the ANC government. I also want to, apart from thanking you, to also apologize that uh, we did put you through, especially you, through a period where you, you lost confidence in the leadership of the country. Uh, it was not a pleasant moment to hear you as the Archbishop that we've always loved expressing your loss of uh, hope and, uh, and your loss of confidence. And I just wanted to say I'm sorry to put you through that, but we will work very hard to regain your confidence. <laughs> Indeed, I am very, very happy and great honor uh, to talk one of my old friend and spiritual friend. So I really happy having this opportunity. Although physically, we say distance, but mentally, we always together. I always consider you as an elder spiritual brother. So naturally, now getting older, older, but your spirit remain uh, generation to generation. I myself 
You see, till my death, I carry your spirit. And then one occasion, our meeting at Dharmsala, you mentioned as a believer of God. So you, after death, ready to go heaven. Uh, I am, according to Christianity, I am not a believer. So Dalai Lama uh, go something different place. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, act like a holy man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I consider that person also, you see, mischievous person. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that person is Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he's a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question of um, how you think about your own deaths. <laughs> that possibility. <laughs> Quite polite. <laughs> well, he doesn't mind too much because there's the reincarnation. <laughs> Always troubling me. <laughs> <laughs> I admire him enormously. Oh, oh, he's going to get proud. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just saying, he is there for us as a, as a beacon. So I really love, you see, he always teasing me, and also I tease him. Oh, is it so? So we really become something, something quite special. Yes. So, mm. and also his face <laughs> is, you see, the head looks like a monk now. <laughs> <laughs> no. oh. <laughs> <laughs> you see, this picture, special picture, uh, I think at time of my death, I will remember you. People, uh, when they saw uh, your face, and hopefully my face, then at least a short moment, they get some kind of peace. So, uh, so I very much appreciate you, in spite of your old age, still you dedicated well-being of other. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my dear friend. What do you actually do when you forgive someone? Well, basically, you're saying I am abandoning my right to revenge, to pay back. I, I mean, I have, I, by the fact that you have abused me, you have hurt me, or whatever it is that you have done, you have wronged me. By that, you have given me a certain right, as it were, over you, that I could refuse to forgive you. I could say I have the right to retribution. When I forgive, I say I jettison that right, and I open the door of opportunity to you to make a new beginning. That is what I do when I forgive you. The, the Buddhist talk of letting go of the past, dying to the past when you forgive, of letting loose of the sorrow that you have brought with you from the past, is that what you're talking yes. about? The, the thing is, of course, that I don't know that you yourself are able uh, by a, an act of will, as it were, to let go of the pain. Uh, the will part of it, where you will is deliberately to say, 
I am not going to let you victimize me and hold me in the position where I have an anger against you, a resentment, and I am looking for the opportunity to pay back. I am saying I want to let go of that, uh, that right, uh, and, and begin to work for the possibility of restoring the relationship. Do I have to do anything, the person being forgiven? For your own sake, the only way you can appropriate forgiveness is by confessing. That opens you. That opens uh, you to the possibility of being able to receive it. It's like, it's like, it's like opening a window. You see, f forgiveness can be likened to the fresh air that is outside or the sunlight that is outside. And, and, and you have a room and, and, the, and the windows are closed and the curtains are drawn. The wind is still out there. My forgiveness is still available to you. But it won't find access until you open the window and the light streams in. You draw the curtains apart and the, and the fresh air comes in. You, by your contrition and confession, you say, I am sorry. Forgive me, open, and my forgiveness enters your being. We're talking here about genocide, torture. Are genocide and torture forgivable? As a Christian, you, you have to say, are there things that are unforgivable? I'm afraid we follow a Lord and Master who at the point when they are crucifying him in the most painful way, can say, pray for their forgiveness. And we follow the one who says, forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. That is, for us, the paradigm. We may not always reach to that ideal, but that is the standard. So now, uh, we religious people uh, should follow like Bishop Tutu, complete our city peace. Uh, we jokingly telling, I am believer, uh, I'm, I, I, I believe this is life after life and no belief creator. <laughs> Bishop Tutu believe creator. <laughs> so sometimes uh, he joked me, he ready go to heaven. I may go some, somewhere, different place. <laughs>